special guest coming up next. We have Shekhar Detatri. Now, Shekhar is a wildlife and conservation filmmaker. For more than 20 years, he has been using film to make impact, focusing on conservation in issues in India. His films have aired on the National Geographic uh, Television, the Discovery Channel, BBC, Natural History, History Unit, History New Zealand, Channel 4, and many more. He has also received numerous awards, including national awards in India, a special jury award at the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival, Best Nature Film at the Tokyo Earth Vision Festival, and more. He serves on juries uh, for several prestigious film festivals and environmental film festivals around the world, and has even authored children's books about conservation. He's a Rolex laureate, served as a member of the National Board for Wildlife with the Government of India, and is the co-founder of Conservation India. We are so excited uh, to welcome Shekhar Dutatri to uh, the Global BioFest. Welcome. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I know I'm on a tight leash here, time-wise. So may I uh, jump into my presentation straight away? Yes, please. We can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. So I'm just going to share screen now. Power and impact of narrow casting and conservation. Um, as we all know, a powerful film can be a very effective tool for conservation. But in my opinion, it can only be that if it's used in the right way. Today, I'm going to talk about a particular method of using films to bring about tangible change on the ground. Until the year 2000, I was a freelance naturalist producer for international television. And as you can see, I really enjoyed my job and it was just the most wonderful life. But even back then, uh, a lot of us who were in the industry uh, wondered whether television shouldn't be focusing more on the important issues confronting our planet, such as deforestation, fragmentation of habitats by roads and highways, uh, uncontrolled forest fires, illegal hunting, and on and on. Uh, but the problem was that the broadcasters and the audiences seem to have an endless appetite for more and more films on pristine habitats and charismatic animals. But then I ask myself, can we really blame the wildlife broadcast industry? Its remit is to make money and not to save the planet. And like any other business, it works on the usual principles of supply and demand, which means that TV channels will produce more of whatever sells. And as far as the viewers are concerned, people watch TV to be entertained. Pretty pictures make us happy. Uh, if you depress someone too much, they'll just simply change the channel. And there goes the revenue, there goes the uh, you know, broadcasting industry. And even if someone is really interested in watching a conservation film, what can most people actually do about something happening somewhere else? In theory, we can all do all sorts of things. But in reality, the average person does nothing. And let's be honest, most of the time, we can do nothing. Uh, if I'm sitting in Chennai in South India, and I see a film on uh, uh, you know, gorillas and their conservation in Rwanda, and problems uh, conservation of conservation issues there, there's very little I can do about it. Uh, we might watch something on television. It might make us feel sad or angry. But then we move on. The truth of the matter is, television documentaries can rarely bring about change on the ground. In fact, if that were the norm, we would all be living in an exemplary society free of all problems, because all you need to do is make a wonderful television program and everything will be fine. I have absolutely no doubt that broadcasting to millions creates more awareness. But this awareness rarely translates into tangible action. So if broadcasting is not the answer, what is? In my opinion, the answer is narrow casting. So you ask, what is this narrow casting? Let's say there's a conservation issue in my neck of the woods that needs to be resolved. Rather than obsessing about garnering millions of viewers on TV or Facebook or YouTube, I have found that it's far more effective to identify a key few local decision makers who actually have the power to do something and focus on convincing them with a powerful film. 
So instead of broadcasting to a large but helpless audience, I prefer to narrow cast to a small empowered audience. And that I believe really is the key to success when it comes to conservation advocacy. Does it work? Well, let, you give, let me give you some examples. I would like to give you three examples if I have the time, but if I don't, certainly I want to talk about this one case, which I would say was like a David and Goliath kind of uh, scenario. Um, on the left of my screen, you see uh, the picture of a beautiful wilderness. And this is called the Kudremuk National Park. It's a rainforest national park in the Western Ghats of South India. And the Western Ghats are one of the world's biodiversity hotspots with a great deal of endemism, huge biodiversity value, and value as a watershed with three rivers originating in this one park. And long before the park was established, there was a, a iron ore mining operation, open cast iron ore, iron ore mining operation right in the center of this wilderness. And every monsoon in particular, you could see the damage being done to the ecosystems around because the water would run, water of the river, one of the rivers that originated there would run orange with the runoff from the mining area. And that was just one of the impacts. And this was a huge problem. And friends of mine who are conservationists in the state of Karnataka were uh, running a big campaign to stop the mining because the mining uh, lease had finished and the mining company had reapplied for an extra 25 year lease. And if this had been granted, or if this were to be granted, uh, they would have opened up many more hillsides, destroyed much more forest, and polluted more of the rivers. So my friends were campaigning in the Supreme Court of India with a petition saying, maybe 25, 30 years ago, we were not ecologically aware enough, and we destroyed this wonderful wilderness, or a part of it. Today, we know more, and we shouldn't be continuing with this really insane project. And my friends were very keen that uh, to convince the local political establishment and the public. And they were not having too much luck, even though they roped in the electronic media and the print media to talk about all this, uh, public opinion wasn't shifting, political opinion wasn't shifting. And that's when I persuaded them that a short film, which was very surgically made, clinically made uh, with the problems and the solutions um, might actually do the trick. So I volunteered to make a film for them and I spent about 10 days uh, to shoot it and another seven or eight days to put it together. I called the film Mindless Mining, The Tragedy of Kudremuk, made it in two languages, English and the local language, and then gave it to all our volunteers. And they then took it and showed it to as many people who mattered as possible. So we were not concerned about showing the film to millions of people. We wanted to show it to the right people. So uh, these volunteers, would go and show it to small farmers groups who lived downstream of the mine and who were being affected by the runoff. They would also go door to door and show it to uh, members of legislative assemblies, uh, local councillors, uh, village elders, uh, religious heads of uh, temples that were on the riverbanks, uh, members of parliament, and if they could get access to ministers of the state government as well. And to cut a very, very long story short, what happened was uh, during one of the public gatherings where the film was shown to a bunch of farmers, there was a minister from the state government who happened to be there and happened to watch the film. And he was so shocked and he said, I didn't know this was so bad. And uh, you know, I really should bring this to the attention of my cabinet colleagues. So he took the initiative and showed this to some of his cabinet colleagues. And they all agreed that the chief minister, their boss should see it as well. So then it was shown to uh, uh, the group of ministers, including the chief minister, and something absolutely magical happened. Until then, the state of Karnataka had been insisting that the land belonged to Karnataka. This was a huge mining operation employing uh, lots of employees, thousands of employees. They in fact had a township to uh, service the people who worked there, including schools and playgrounds and nurseries and uh, whatever, dispensaries, the whole works. You know, they had apartment buildings full of people. And they wanted to keep this mining going. But once they saw the film and saw the damage that was happening and how amazingly beautiful and ecologically important this area was, 
they decided to file an affidavit in the Supreme Court saying that all along we wanted the mining to happen. Now we've had a change of heart. We know what damage it's doing to our beautiful ecosystem. We don't want the mining operation anymore. And this really weakened the case for the mine. And the Supreme Court of India stopped all mining after three years. And since 2003, there has been absolutely no mining in this area. And I happened to drive through this area last year, uh, nearly 18 years after I made the film. And I was so happy to see that moss has grown on the uh, mine slopes. It's never going to turn into rainforest again. Maybe it will take 10 million years because all the topsoil is gone. But some grass is coming up to hold the slopes together. And the most amazing thing was even though I went there during the height of the monsoon uh, with the rain pouring, the river was flowing crystal clear because there was no more runoff. So this is the power of narrow casting. So I per particularly don't buy into this numbers game. I'm not one of these people who say more is always better. The more people who see it, the more effective a film is. No, I think it's the quality of the audience, not the quantity of the audience that matters. And for me, I have proved this to myself again and again over the last 20 years. So I'm completely sold on the idea. Now, uh, I just want to very quickly talk about two other examples. After the Asian tsunami uh, uh, in, I think it was 2004, uh, there was a huge amount of money pouring in into many of these Asian countries, including India, uh, because the world felt really sorry for what had happened. And you had every multilateral agency, including the World Bank, pumping millions and millions of dollars, saying, here, do something. And the forestry department in my state, which is a coastal state, uh, came up with this uh, amazing idea, uh, well, at least they thought it was amazing, of planting a bio-shield shelter belt along the entire coast of Tamil Nadu. And I'm talking about many, many hundreds of kilometers of coastline. And they went and planted a fast-growing alien tree called Casuarina, which is a native of Australia, but which grows really fast on coastal soils. And what you see on the left are actually uh, Casuarina trees that are several months old. But the problem is where they've planted the trees is exactly where sea turtles come and nest. So in one fell swoop, they completely destroyed sea turtle nesting ground. Sea turtles have been on the planet for 200 million years, and they've been nesting on these beaches for millions and millions of years, and suddenly they had no space to nest. So we wrote a very angry, but a very clear letter to the president of the World Bank and said, this is not on. You've uh, Overnight, you've helped destroy our sea turtle nesting beaches. You've got to do something about it. And we think you should remove these trees for up to 50 meters to allow the turtles to nest. So a few weeks later, we actually had two people from the Delhi office of the World Bank come to Chennai and they came and met us, uh, the three of us who had made this petition. And before they came and met us, they had met the forestry department. And the forestry department told them, look, what do these uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and what do these conservationists know? We are a 150-year-old organization. We know how to take care of our wildlife. And these trees uh, will not affect the turtles in any way. In fact, the turtles can go in between the trees and nest. So when the World Bank team met us, they said, this is what your forestry department has told us. Do you agree? And anticipating this question, I had put together three minutes of clips uh, about the nesting cycle of the olive ridley. And I played this on a laptop. And they could see that this was a 50 kilogram animal, which was about two and a half feet long and almost as wide. And I made it very clear to them there was no way that this huge animal can go between densely packed trees and lay its eggs. And then they could also see that 45 days later, the hatchlings came out of the sand and went into the sea. And I could also point out to them that the sea turtle eggs are uh, incubated by the warmth of the sun and they need complete sunlight. They can't be under the shade of trees. Uh, the eggs would not hatch at all. So once they saw this three minute video, which had no commentary, uh, which had no music, it was just mute with me doing the explanation, they were completely convinced that what we were saying was the truth and what the forestry department was saying was not true. Again, to cut a very long story short, this made a huge impact and the World Bank worked with the local government over a period of months and convinced them 
that the trees had to be removed for 50 meters from the high tide line. So this was another victory of narrow casting, where by managing to just convince a few people, we were able to get rid of a huge conservation problem. Now, I'm not at all saying that all the credit must go to the film or the filmmaker. No, absolutely not. Unless you have the support of good conservationists working with the filmmaker to take the film and show it to the right people, the film is useless. So if I just make these films and put them on YouTube, they wouldn't solve any problem. So I would give a lot of credit to the people who have worked with me, the conservationists who have actually taken these films. I've, emp I've empowered them with a powerful weapon or a tool, and they take it and they do the lobbying. So uh, a great credit to them. The final example I want to give is one of uh, the mass hunting of Amur falcons in the northeast of India, which is a very remote part of India. And within this remote part, in a very, very remote part of this remote part, uh, there was this massive hunting that was accidentally discovered by birder friends of mine who had gone there on a biodiversity survey. And they found that uh, hundreds of thousands of Amur falcons were migrating from uh, China and Russia to South Africa. And they were using the state of Nagaland, one particular spot in Nagaland, as a, as a kind of uh, way station, perhaps to build up their strength. And after spending a few weeks there, perhaps feeding on insects and so on, they were then making the nonstop flight to Somalia, uh, which was uh, perhaps a week's flight from Nagaland. And then from there, they would go down to South Africa. And while they had their way stop, uh, these people who were actually local fishermen who were fishing in a local reservoir, saw this amazing manna from heaven descend uh, for a few weeks every year. And they took their fishing nets and put them on roosting trees. And they were catching these huge numbers of Amur falcons. At a conservative estimate, my uh, friends, including a biologist, estimated they were catching anywhere between 120,000 to 150,000 during one migratory season in this one spot alone. Uh, and it was just an incredible massacre because it wasn't just a few local people catching a few falcons to eat, but they were actually catching them for commercial trade and these falcons were being sold to people all over the state of Nagaland. So this was clearly an unsustainable uh, exploitation. So what we did was my friends shot some stills and some videos, and they immediately sent it to me in Chennai. I didn't even go to Nagaland. I quickly put together three minutes of clips in a very logical sequence, uh, showing the whole progression of how this hunting was happening. And we put some simple text on why this shouldn't happen. And I sent, sent it back to the people in the field. They then took this little clip on their laptops and showed it to four or five top bureaucrats in Nagaland who actually had the power to make decisions. And when they realized that this was an illegal activity which was banned under the Wildlife Protection Act of India and that it was going on despite the illegality, and when they saw the scale at which this was happening, they worked to immediately put a stop to this. Now. Uh, this was, again, the power of narrow casting, where we took the film, showed it to just a handful of people, and we got this amazing result. Of course, after that initial result, my friends have been working with the local community for several years now, and absolutely no hunting happens because the local community has now taken ownership of these Amur falcons, and they actually celebrate their arrival every year. So you need to do both, obviously. But my argument is, if we had waited to get a huge amount of funding from a big television channel to make a grand film about this and two or three years later put this film on television, it still might not have had any impact at all. But by taking it to the right people, we were able to avert the massacre of more Amur falcons. So I'm just going to go very quickly into the advantages of narrow casting. I'm sorry if I'm kind of racing through this, but I want to beat my time. So uh, let me slow down here and tell you the advantages of narrow casting. The first advantage is you can produce a film very cheaply with available equipment. You don't need fancy cameras. You can even shoot a film with a cell phone. As long as the pictures are clear, they're in focus, and you are holding the camera steady, and you get a good documentation, that might be enough. The second thing is you can use crowdsource material, both stills and videos. So for some of my advocacy films, as long as I get uh, footage from very, very reliable sources on the ground, I incorporate them into my films. And that makes it easier for me to produce these films quickly. 
The third thing is your audience is captive and has the power to act. Now, what do I mean by captive? This is an extremely important point because when you uh, broadcast a film on television, you don't know how people are watching it. Uh, you know, uh, people have so many other distractions. They're looking at WhatsApp messages on their phones. Uh, uh, somebody might be talking to their spouse or the baby might be crying, uh, you know, so they're not really paying full attention to what, what they're watching. Also, they might not have started in the beginning or they might end before the program ends. But with narrow casting, you're going to people and you're begging them for some time saying, look, I need to show you a 10 minute film, but I want you to see it without distractions. So please, can you put your cell phone away, put it on silent and just give me 10 minutes of undivided attention for this important matter that I want to talk to you about. And then you show them the film on your laptop or on a TV or with headphones on. And for those three minutes or 10 minutes, they are completely immersed in the issue. So they've completely got the gist of what you're trying to say. And that is so important. And finally, these are the people who have the power to sign a piece of paper that can make a difference. So they are a very, very special audience for you. And if you manage to convince them, then you have a far better chance of success than if you show it to 20 million people around the world. Now, uh, in terms of bang for your buck, there is simply no comparison. Because in the year 1999 and 2000, I made a big film for television broadcast, international television broadcast uh, on the Indian monsoon. It was a natural history film with no conservation in it. But that film cost something like 500,000 US dollars. But the film on the mining that I made, uh, which closed down, helped to close down this huge mining operation, was made for less than $1,000. So let's just, let, let that just sink in. You know, where's $1,000 and where's $500,000? So it's just incredible value you get for what you do. So my mantra for narrow casting is very, very simple. I keep the film short and very tight because bureaucrats and politicians, they don't have much time to give you. And they're also very, very intelligent people. They can get it the first time. So don't belabor the points. Keep it tight, keep it short. I don't complicate a film with multiple issues because that dilutes the focus. And then people don't know what they're supposed to focus on. If there are five issues and one of them is a major issue, I focus on the major issue. The other four issues can be solved through other means. I don't exaggerate or embellish. Even for a good cause, I show it as it is. Because if you exaggerate or embellish and you get caught with a lie, then your entire work and you yourself are discredited and your credibility goes for a toss. I show evidence. It's not enough to talk about something. It's really important for people to see the, uh, something with their own eyes. So if there's tremendous ecosystem damage happening, you've got to show it. You can't just say, hey, this is going to happen or this will happen or this happens at a certain time of the year. You need to be able to show it because seeing is believing. I also suggest clear solutions or outcomes that are based on science. And this is really, really important. I don't just make up some solutions. I do a lot of research. I talk to scientists. I talk to people in the field. And I collate all their thoughts and present simple solutions that are also very pragmatic and possible for them to implement. And finally, I appeal to the head and to the heart. Uh, bureaucrats and politicians can be very, very hard headed. So you need to make an economic argument as well on why you think conservation is more important than exploitation. But since people are all emotional animals, uh, even a politician or a bureaucrat has a heart, uh, much as we like to think that sometimes they don't. They're just like us. So we need to appeal to their heart as well and to national pride and state pride and local pride. So these are the things that need to be incorporated in a film as well. Um, so I've practiced narrow casting for 20 years. And before that, I was a filmmaker for another 15 years making blue chip natural history films. So from my 35 years of filmmaking experience, I can say that narrow casting really works. And there's so much more that I need to say. But since I don't have the time, I would be very happy to share tips and suggestions on how you can tackle conservation problems through filmmaking. You can contact me through my website, shekardatta3.com. So I will stop sharing now. And uh, maybe Brianna can wrap this up for me. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. What a great idea. I haven't really ever thought about that because it's always about the numbers and the numbers and the social media numbers. But really what we're seeing in social media is everyone who already thinks one way is already getting that content. So I have a question with narrow casting and it seems like a bit of a challenge. If you're a young filmmaker and, you know, 
we take your advice. There's some great advice there for how to make these films. How do you find these right people? How do you find the bureaucrats? And how do you sit them down? And, and how do you get these films in front of them? See, the thing is, the filmmaker should not think that he or she can or should do everything. So I know that my skills are in filmmaking. So uh, I ally myself with a lot of charities who are doing conservation work and individual conservationists who have the grassroots uh, knowledge, who have the contacts in the community and who know who are the relevant bureaucrats and politicians. So through this network, we leverage every contact that all of us have. So you always have some uncle who knows somebody else, who knows somebody who can get you through the door, right? So you need to be very savvy and you need to use all these methods to get the people, uh, you know, uh, and get your laptop in front of them. It's not that difficult, but it's not so easy either. So you need to leverage all your contacts. Great. Yeah, we have uh, Mariana in the chat says she's going to be using your tips. So thank you for from Mariana in the chat. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I know that you are a Rolex laureate. Um, can you tell us about that program and how it has helped contribute to your work? I think uh, I got my award in 2004. I started my conservation filmmaking in, uh, two, in the year 2000 uh, after I'd had a stint with the broadcast industry. I was uh, disillusioned with the broadcast industry and I didn't blame them, but I knew that television wasn't the answer. So I said, let me become a conservation filmmaker and try narrow casting. So in 2004, I wrote up a proposal which was changing hearts and minds through moving images. And Rolex, uh, I was actually an associate laureate and I got money to buy equipment which included a mini DV camera at the time and uh, some basic computer editing equipment. And this kind of helped me launch my narrow casting and take it to the next level. So that was a very important award which came at the right time and which gave a big boost to my uh, conservation filmmaking and narrow casting. Great. Yeah, and I, I do have one more question. What, what is next? What's the next project? Where, what is the next conservation issue in India that you want to um, bring forward to the right people using narrow casting? Well, you know, India has a tremendous amount of wildlife still left. If you look at Asia as a whole, India has an amazing diversity and abundance of wildlife, but we also have an abundance of problems. So there's always about 10 ideas on the burner, and I'm not quite sure what the exact next one is going to be. But the last one I did was on uh, the impact of roads and highways on national parks and uh, wildlife habitats. It's called From Killer Roads to Humane Highways. It's again a film for narrow casting. It's meant for decision makers, but I've also put it on YouTube for other people to see. And somebody who wants to see the kind of style that I adopt for narrow casting can get a look at what kind of films I make because it's very different from the television films I used to make, which used to have a very seductive narrator, beautiful music, fantastic imagery. Narrow casting doesn't need a lot of things. Uh, uh, it doesn't need great production values and it needs a different approach to filmmaking. You can be much more forceful. You need to be much more forceful. Sometimes you need to be preachy, which is a no-no for television. So it's a completely different style. So if somebody wants to go and see it, they can go and look at mindless mining and they can look at uh, uh, From Killer Roads to Humane Highways. Great, well, thank you so much for really pioneering this concept and really sharing it with all the young filmmakers out there. We have Amanda Kay also in the chat who is, um, says that this is a very uh, great, uh, what did she say, trackable issue, better than broadcasting. So thank you for sharing it and sharing all of your tips. Um, and yeah, definitely uh, check out your website and all the videos that are up there. Um, and thank you for spending the, the morning with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a great honor and a pleasure. Wonderful.